Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Robinson, psychotherapist in Austin, Texas. I'm here today with Anne Weiser Cornell as a part of a series of interviews with expert practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. In this series, we interview a wide variety of experiential practitioners so as to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential methodologies. Anne is an internationally known author and psychology educator who has been working with the focusing process since she learned it in 1972 from its originator, Eugene Jenlin. With her colleague, Barbara McGavin, Anne developed an approach to emotional healing called inner relationship focusing and an application to that approach to difficult life issues called untangling. Anne gives presentations, workshops and trainings through her organisation, Focusing Resources. Her books include The Radical Acceptance of Everything and Focusing in Clinical Practice, The Essence of Change. Welcome, Anne. Thank you so much for making the time today. Happy will... to be here. Good. I'd love to just jump in. I mean, it sounds like you're focused on focusing. Jump in. <laughs> so could you jump tell in. us a little bit about how or if focusing is an experiential um, therapy? Well, I don't think focusing is a therapy at all. Focusing is an experiential process that was observed in clients who were tending to make progress in their therapy. In the early research I'm talking about, that was done in the 1950s at the University of Chicago by Carl Rogers and the people around him, including my mentor, Eugene Gendlin. And they were testing hypotheses about what it was that helped clients make progress. And they were trying out, does it, is it because the therapist is more present, more empathic? Is it because the therapist is more warm and sort of loving toward the person? Does it have to do with the relational quality in the room? And they found out something very interesting. The most, the factor that most correlated with progress in psychotherapy wasn't anything the therapist was doing at all. They could notice a difference in clients who were the ones who were going to tend to make success, successful psychotherapy progress. The clients who were successful tended to speak of themselves, their feelings, their experiences in the present moment. And those who didn't, who sort of were at dead ends or stayed stuck in their therapy, were speaking of their feelings, but of the feelings they had in the past. Or I always feel depressed, sort of generalizations about their feelings instead of, well, right now I'm feeling kind of nervous. And a further indicator that was noticed when they did more research was not just that the clients spoke of their present feelings, but that many of those clients who were going to be successful in psychotherapy tended to point toward their bodies or refer to their bodies. They tended to slow down when they were speaking and they would grope for words like it wasn't easy to articulate quickly and glibly what they're feeling right now. Um, it's, um, I don't know how to say this. Uh, it's right here. If clients were doing this, they tended to do it in the first or second session. It wasn't something they learned how to do because of their therapy. And so the researchers, including Eugene Gendlin, said, oh, my gosh. In order to be ethical therapists, we better see, we better see if we can facilitate this for clients who aren't doing it. And that's where the taught method called focusing, the name focusing, came from. Because it was meant to be, it, it was developed as a way of inviting clients to have these moments of experiential contact that were more likely to lead to success. So focusing, I think, to start with was an observation of something that certainly happens in every experiential therapy. I think every one of your, the people in your organization who are doing experiential psychotherapy have noticed this kind of client process. Um, Hmm. Hard to hard to say, but it's uh, 
And I facilitate focusing, which means I deliberately take clients I work with into that zone using the way I respond to them and sometimes gentle invitations. That's brilliant. I love it. Um, I, th- I, I, I imagine that some therapists uh, watching may, may <laughs> the bit when you said it's nothing to do with the therapist uh, may be alarming. <laughs> but actually to have these people that naturally have this way of exploring their inner self and knowing that that's a deeper way to connect and therefore change happens more consistently is what a wonderful observation that must have been. Well, I don't want to be heard as, and I I understand, I may have said it doesn't have to do with the therapist. Yes, but I, I take it back. Because of course, for a client to be able to have this fresh present moment contact with themselves, there's got to be enough comfort, safety, and warmth in the room. And there are other behaviors that a therapist can engage in that make it more likely for clients to do that. So it, of course, it has to do with the therapist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Wow. So that must have been um, really brilliant research to be like, okay, there's these moments. They were te- they were seeing moments of change with certain people and wondering why that wasn't happening with others. And so they sort of watched or listened to sessions and picked out, oh, it's this type of language that people have about the inner world, which seems to be the indicator for change. Carl Rogers was the first person to do psychotherapy research, as far as I know. Nobody else was doing that kind of recording sessions, listening to them, analyzing them, listening for certain aspects. And from that first research, those researchers developed something called the experiencing scale, which further other researchers could use as a way of rating the kinds of things the client were saying, where low experiencing meant people who didn't talk about feelings at all, only about events in the past. And then mid-experiencing, they talked about feelings, but not really freshly. And high experiencing would be what I'm talking about here, where they'd pause and sense what it is now and and mm. so on. So it's it's great research. Yeah. Yeah. And you could it's um it's kind of what you're saying seems so clear when I think about my own clinical work or like, you know, um, supporting, having supervisees or whatever. And they're talking about the sort of how fast the conversation can be with some clients. And it's very like cognitive. And there isn't that pause moment of like, what's the felt sense inside from here and speaking from that place, which often, like you said, doesn't even have a word. It's like a felt sense. And we're going to it's so nuanced and, and um, subjective to the client. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to hear about um, like what you what you see as a practitioner in terms of like the the indicators of this very thing happening. Like how you right. know, like oh, this right. is what we're shooting for here. I think the most important indicator for me is if people are willing to check the words they're using again inside themselves. Mm. which is one reason that what I do quite a lot with people is say their words back to them. Not, and if, and you have to choose which words you say back, because if people are just talking, here's how my day went, here's how my week went. It sounds kind of dumb to just repeat those words. But when people do just begin to slow down a little and say, you know, I think, I think what's really what I'm really aware of right now is, is a sense of emptiness. And then if I say back, you're sensing maybe a sense of emptiness. And then what I'm hoping they'll do is say, yeah, or, hmm, no, not, not quite emptiness. It's more. And that moment when somebody says not quite, mm, it's more, hmm. Then I know they're focused. That's brilliant. So kind of nudging them. It's almost like I imagine you're, you're sort of nudging them into a deeper experiential state, even by reflecting back the kind of maybe deepest words you've heard, like the feeling of emptiness, letting them check in for them for, on a systems level. Is that right? And if not, they get to edit it, which probably means going a layer deeper. Anyway, they have to go in in order to find what feels more right. And it's that contact with themselves. 
that open kind of curious contact with themselves that really leads to even breakthroughs. It definitely me means that they're not just going to repeat the stories they've always been telling themselves. Now, I think stories are important. I'm not saying, I'm, sometimes people hear me as saying, well, you don't want to hear any client stories. No, something very powerful happens when a client tells us a story. And perhaps it's being heard by us and received in the room for the first time. But then after a story, there's possibly an openness to sense how that all sits in me now. And that might be the moment to give an intervention. Okay. Wow, there's all that that happened. And maybe there's a way that is in you right now. And uh, then we see somebody kind of sinking down, sinking in. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. I, I, I instantly, you know, I'm thinking about clients I've had where um, the response to that, you know, the hope that there's, you know, okay, we've, we've heard a story. That's great. Like, yeah, what's what's happening on a bodily level? And a client will go, well, nothing. Or like, you know, they respond with a, well, well like I just said, it's, you know, last week and, you know, that, that kind of thing comes up again. I mean, I wonder, is, is there a way focusing kind of works with that? Like, is it is that a type of resistance to the process or is that like, how is that handled? I wouldn't call it resistance, although I must say I love resistance. That is, if the person is aware of not wanting to do something, that's a very rich area to, to stay with. But if a person just get, says it's nothing, well, I think a couple of things might be going on. First, did you ask a question? Did the clinician ask a question before the person says there's nothing? Or, And the reason I say that is my background, my PhD is in linguistics. I was studying linguistics when I met my mentor, Eugene Gendlin, at the University of Chicago and, and moved over. And what I learned from linguistics is that when you ask somebody a question, you're actually inviting them into their heads and inviting them to say something they already know and, and have prepared. And I started to notice this as I worked with clients that so, so many times they would say nothing or I don't know. And then I started to notice it's, it was usually after I'd asked a question. Well, what can I say instead of asking, asking a question? Well, you can often rephrase a question just by putting the word notice or you might notice in front of it. So take, how does that feel right now? I don't know. Take some time to notice how that feels right now. Mm -hmm. You can even maybe even feel that difference where the question sort of wants you to come back to it. Now, yeah. I know a lot of great clinicians ask questions and it works for them. And I just admire that. You know, it means that their presence with people is enough to counteract the tendency of questions to make people go into the head. But the first thing to think about if you're getting I don't know from clients is could I try saying it without asking a question? Just maybe take some time with that. And that's the other thing you might say is, well, let's take some time. Because the speed of thinking and talking is up here. And the slowing down and pausing lets us sink down here. And then third, and perhaps most important of all, am I myself as the clinician aware down here too? Am I experiencing the client from my heart, my gut, and not just thinking about them? Because uh, one of the great figures in focusing-oriented therapy, Lynn Preston once said, for a therapy to be focusing-oriented, the client doesn't have to be focusing, the therapist has to be focusing. I love that. I love that. I really love the way you you <clears throat> transition that that question into like an invitation for an experience instead of like, right. how are you feeling now? It's like this subtle, like, let's slow down and like feel into it. And even the way you said it was really beautiful, too. It kind of made me go, <laughs> you know, check in with myself for a minute and that like really encouraging the taking time, because 
I think you're right. It's like you may perhaps you can ask a cognitive question and be met with a cognitive response. And maybe as a therapist kind of go, well, it's not working or it's wrong instead of, you know, checking in with yourself and then being like, okay, yeah, let's just take some time here. And I'll do the same with myself, you know, as the therapist. I love it. Well, let me say a little more about that, Sam, because when you just fed back to me what I said, you repeated, let's take some time. I just want to emphasize that speaking of the relational dimension between client and therapist, often invitations can be let's rather than you. And that's really lovely. And the other thing I wanted to say is I consider these invitations, as you said, an invitation means that it can be refused. I am not controlling the client, demanding that they feel inside right now. I'm making an invitation. My spirit of it is they may not take the invitation. They may keep going with their cognitive thinking analytical process, saying the same things they've already always said. Okay, well, that's fine. I'll be present with that. I'll do my best to listen to what they want me to hear when they say that. But then later in the session, there may be a chance for another invitation. So my attitude is of acceptance. And I think acceptance is is really key. Yeah, yeah. I, something I say a lot in doing these interviews, I hear little things that are like, oh, wow, what a relief. And I hear you saying, like, let go of the outcome. <laughs> you know, you're making these invitations. It's not like, well, this is supposed to happen following this. It's like, here you go. Okay, I'm good with that inside. Here's, we're going to keep going. It's like a very gentle nudging along rather than like, okay, we need to be at this point by now. Right, exactly. And a, and a curiosity about what is this person going to be like? Because I may have heard about the research and had training and seen 100 or 200 or so many clients up till now. This person's going to be different from everybody else. They're going to surprise me. So I don't know in advance what will help them, what they need. So it's, it's like having both at the same time. Yes, I have some ideas. That if I invite people into present moment experiencing, that will probably be a good idea. And at the same time, I want to see how they work. I want to see what works for them, what helps them feel safe here in the room, and be curious because everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems to be a real theme in experiential work is the like not knowing. It's like the therapist is a guide and maybe they have like a vehicle, but they don't know what road they're going to end on or how it's, where it's going to go. Um, Makes it I fun, th doesn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so fun, so rich and like exciting and really a wonderful setup for any client too. Like, okay, this person doesn't have a preconceived idea of who I am and what's going on in here. It's, it's really nice. I agree. Good, good. So what do you do? Um, kind of maybe in a bit more detail, if you have a client who doesn't seem to get felt senses? First, I try to be with them the way they are. So if they want to tell me a story, if they want to analyze what's going on, if they're talking about something that happened in the past, instead of staying in the present moment, I want to go with them. But I'll look for the opportunities. So I'm interested if, as the person's talking, they start slowing down at some point. If they seem to start indicating their body, especially if they'll say, my throat is tight, my, I feel a heaviness here, but it's not always that obvious. The slowing down, the indicating that they're starting to be aware at a bodily present moment level. These are things to watch for and then to encourage. So I teach my students, if they, I'm teaching them to facilitate focusing, I teach them two things. Notice, oh, I have to give you a terminology. These unclear senses in the body, Gendlin called them felt senses felt sense. And he invented that word. Now a lot of people use it. And they don't mean quite what he meant by it. So this is one of my 
one of my missions. What he meant by a felt sense is the unclear sense that's coming now. So when you get an indication that the client is having a felt sense already, you didn't have to do anything to encourage it, but they're, they're pausing. They're saying, I, I don't know how to say this, but it's right here. Then you can support that. You know, way back when I it wasn't, I wasn't a therapist or, or a facilitator yet, but I, I was a conversationalist. I would have conversations with my friends where they couldn't think of a word, and I would always try to supply their word. <laughs> and learning, of course, about focusing and also being present with people, I don't supply their words anymore because there's something so important about that moment when that word is freshly forming, and it ought to be their moment, not mine. And so how can I in support those moments? Uh, oh, I have an example of that. It, it's, a, it's an invented example, but it, it's, it's indicative. Okay, so the client is sitting across from you and says, um, sometimes I think I'm, I'm just lazy or there's something wrong with me. But, you know, I guess when I... I guess when I think about it, there's like a little kid inside, um, kind of, kind of saying, "No, I won't." Oh, I don't know. I guess I'm just just being resistant. So the, it's almost like the client gives you a sandwich: <laughs> self analysis, moment of pausing, self analysis, and you don't want to say back the last thing they said especially not as a question. So how are you being resistant? <laughs> Instead, find those moments when they were referring to something real and say back those. I call this the empathic prompt. I, te I teach it in my, my book, Focusing in Clinical Practice. It's when you, you hear in a whole paragraph from the client, this one word or one moment when they're when they're sensing something presently felt inside, then the response would be, ah, so there's something like a little kid inside. And then perhaps add an invitation. Maybe take a little longer with that. So you're, you're listening for those moments and then helping the person stay longer with those. Mm -hmm. Wow, I love it. Yeah, you're really, you really have to be kind of finely tuned to sift through what the client is saying and, and noticing which is a, a moment to, to kind of deepen into, which I imagine can be hard when you have a client that wants to sort of process the week or like their job and all of that stuff. So you really, it's a very mindful, I have to be listened and I need to dog ear those, these meaningful moments and, and, and maybe deepen and have an invitation there. Well, I think if you have your awareness in your own body, it's not as hard as you're saying, because your body will sort of light up when the person goes there. And it's not hard to remember that either, because you're sort of, you're bookmarking it. Oh, wow. I want to say that back to them, no matter how much they say between, you know, saying it and let, when I get to have a word in edgewise, I'm going to say, you know, a little while ago, you were talking about that sort of sad place in your chest right now. I'm still kind of with that. Shall we, how would, how would you like to stay a bit longer there? And yeah, if you're, if you're in your own body, they're not too hard. But the other question that's important is what if that doesn't happen? What if you have a client who, as you say, just never drops down, never goes in. And then there are these invitations that are usually invitations to stay longer or take more time. Maybe we could have a pause right there. Now you've been telling me about X, Y, and Z, how your daughter did this and, and her husband, et cetera. Let's pause a moment. And maybe just have the feel of that. And I might say the word body, maybe just have the feel of that in your body right now. Or if I feel the client isn't open to words like body, I'll just kind of 
gesture and say, maybe just have the feel of that here now. Or maybe how that whole thing sits in you now. And it's an invitation. They might not take it. If they take it, I love it. If they don't take it, okay, I'll be ready for the next opportunity. Mm-hmm. So, so um, really, like as doing your own focusing work as a focusing practitioner is super helpful, necessary for the process. Necessary, really mm-hmm. necessary. Yeah. I was going to ask you, Anne, do you ever to help clients like you? Um, nudge into the, the 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 sort of inner work. Which do you ever like use self disclosure? Like say, oh, when you mentioned that thing about so and so, I felt this sort of sadness in me. Like I want to check in with you or something like that. Or is that yes, absolutely, absolutely? Because I'm in touch with how things impact me, and in order to maybe even make it make it understandable why I'm suggesting they go back to something they said a few minutes ago instead of this new thing they're talking about now. You know, I'm I'm still with what you were saying about that lonely little girl inside. I I felt kind of touched when you said that. I'm just wondering how that is for you, you know? And it's if, it's going to be true, right? Don't make things up. But that's another benefit of staying with your own feelings while you're with a client is that you can make use of them plus it's a modeling isn't it yeah yeah you're saying it's it's okay to do this thing that i'm i'm doing with you in this moment so we're in this together and i'm feeling stuff along the way too right right so yeah it really helps with the safety for the for the client i wonder if ever though it could you know if a client didn't uh, connect with the thing you were feeling if it could like if that could be dysregulating like oh no i don't feel sad about that or you know you know. Well, I'd be happy. Okay. Sad doesn't fit for you. Let's fit. Let's sense what would fit better for you than sad. Sad. Oh, it's it, it's still it's still like a trailhead into the into yes. the deeper work. <laughs> Absolutely. I I love it when people say no to me. You know, because no is a trailhead. That's I said earlier. I love resistance, and that's kind of part of why. Yes. Oh, so you're you're in a. Uh, Self is saying thank you <laughs> for that. Right. It's like, oh, good. You could tell sad didn't fit for you. I'm excited. You mm-hmm. see? <laughs> because they had to check in order to, know. well, not totally, but I'm, I'm taking the most optimistic viewpoint that they had to check in order to know that sad didn't fit. It could have been something else, but it's okay. Yeah, and it also we'll just lead, leads in nicely to the, uh, if they didn't check long enough or it, or it was a split second check, it, the, the next point is well, what does fit, which invites perhaps a real slowing down. And maybe they do say, I mean, it's all hypothetical. But maybe I know. They do go, it's possible. Oh, it is, it is sad. I've just never <laughs> slowed down to look, you know. No, I know. Or they say, yes, sad. Me too. But not quite. Actually, sad's not the right word. <laughs> no, I'm in heaven. <laughs> Uh, I love your passion for the process. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, yeah. And even, even how you're subtly delivering sort of little interventions, I can hear your, even your tone of voice is very sort of inviting and like, um, um, yeah, it's just really pleasant to hear. I just wanted to share that. Mm, mm, thanks a lot. I think you've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I might, I might have been. <laughs> <laughs> um. I was also curious, like, what is, is there like a, um, a moment of like change or like healing that the focusing methodology is looking for? Like, is it, is it purely the, the, the the change from, um, cognitive to kind of felt sense? Like, is that the, is that the sort of, uh, the most important part of the process or is there like a, you know, just would a client come in and say, oh, I have, I, I, you know, I'm anxious when I talk in front of people. Um, focusing would look to heal that in some way. Does that make sense? Wow, it makes sense, and I'd love to talk about it. Because the forming of a felt sense is really only the first moment, and there's much more after that. Mm. So, and Jemblin said, when the felt sense forms, the whole problem has already changed. 
And that's true. But what Barbara McGavin and I discovered is that people tend to have other things than felt senses that are also important to form relationships with inside. And, and I think the easiest way to talk about these non-felt sense inner experiences is to call them parts. So many, many forms of parts work today. We developed our own parts work to enhance focusing. And that's why we call it inner relationship focusing. So the, the development of focusing, which Jendlin approved of before he died. <laughs> um, if you have a persistent, repetitive, reactive reaction state, you could say, it's not a felt sense, even if it feels bad in the body. And so issues like procrastination or being stuck about doing an action or being having an, an, having an addiction, a repetitive action you can't stop, or repeated depression or repeated activation in certain trauma-related current situations. Those, those need, need some parts work as well as felt sensing. So a person who's, what was the example you just used? Uh, anxious not, talking in front of people. Anxious so talking anxiety. in front of people, exactly. So using my linguistics, I would first invite the person to say something in me gets anxious talking in social situations. So that shift in language from I get anxious to something in me gets anxious is called disidentification and it enables a relationship. And then I invite them to say, I am sensing something in me that gets anxious in social situations. So those two phrases. I am sensing something in me, the client says, or I'll speak to the client saying, you are sensing something in you gets anxious in social situations. And my hope is that they will then turn toward, like inwardly relate to the something that gets anxious. Often when people find something in them that gets anxious, this identification, there's a second part that is upset about that, doesn't like it, is being inwardly critical about it. You shouldn't do that. That's stupid. It means there's something defective about you. And then we help people. I am sensing this. I am sensing this. And that's also still just the beginning. Because once you have a relationship with something that you feel that's getting anxious or refusing something or acting in an out of control way and so on then you want to sit with it to get to know it better describe the way it feels say hello i know you're there so these are relational inner relational moves that i can encourage for the person but they're the one who does it and by the way i teach focusing to people as a self help skill and these are the steps I'm sensing something in me. I'm sitting with it. I'm saying hello to it. I'm getting to know it better. I'm sensing how it feels emotionally. And at some point, the it reveals itself. It, it, may, show an, it, it may show an image or a memory from the past. When I worked, when I used focusing to work with my writer's block, I didn't know yet about this way of talking. It was one of the sources. One day, inspired perhaps by hearing from a friend who worked with Gestalt, after years of not being able to get past writer's block, I sat down to do focusing and I said, maybe there's something in me that doesn't want to write. And then I brought awareness into my body. I got quiet and waited and sure enough, in my body, I began to feel a kind of forward, well, the word I found for it eventually was ducking. There was a sense of ducking. Oh, okay. And after staying with the feeling of ducking for a while, I got an image of 
being in front of a target on a firing range. And right, okay, I acknowledge that. Let's stay with it. Staying with that a while. I got a memory of my dad in my childhood shooting at me with sarcasm. And it became clear the something in me that didn't want to write wanted to protect me from my father's criticism. So that was the process of listening, me listening to it without trying to analyze it, without figuring out what it meant. When I get an image like a target and I'm in front of it, I just say, okay, let's keep going. And then it reveals itself. And after a few sessions like that, my writer's block went away. So, so brilliant. I mean, it sounds like what you're describing is memory reconsolidation. <laughs> you know, you're like starting with the sticky symptom, which actually isn't the sort of what you're shooting for. You're shooting for the for the deeper layers, the sort of getting to know these parts that ha- hold on some emotional truth about how the world works. And it may or may not be revealed in images or words. And then in your case, you got to this realization about the um the sarcasm from your father which probably your brain was enough for your brain to go well this this isn't necessary for me anymore yeah go on well so what we're doing when we use that kind of language i am sensing something in me feels is we're accessing the way we're more than and bigger than whatever this was when a person says i'm anxious they're identified with the part that's anxious and they aren't in that bigger space, often using the language, and there are some other interventions as well, enables people to be in that bigger space. The name that Barbara and I give that bigger space is self in presence. And a client, even in the greatest distress, can access self in presence with gentle prompts. Maybe maybe you could be with that is one of them. So it's exactly what you're saying, Sam. It's because I'm now not that, but the larger, that I see a larger perspective. I see that that's the past. For the part, the past and present are fused. It is still a little kid getting sarcasm from her father. But from the bigger space, I don't even have to say anything to myself. I don't even have to say, well, that's over now. It's the past. It happens. Yeah. So cool. So cool. And I, and, it, and it's sounding, especially for that younger part of you, it, it's so coherent that there would be the fear of, you know, the sarcasm. It's, and, I, and I imagine the process of tending to that part, understanding it, hearing from it, you know, and it may be getting a sense from you that, you know, now I'm a, I'm not we're not there anymore or whatever it is is enough for the part to release its like panic or dread of of being um yeah yeah it's so the releasing wonderful. happens the releasing happens you don't have to do something like unburdening or or explaining or anything like that it 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 simply happens That's yeah great. yeah and really starting with um it's it sounds a little bit like ifs like the, the creating space between like you as the socially anxious person and you and the part of you that's anxious socially and and creating yes. curiosity and 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 not yeah um that makes it i mean it's really a deep un, uh, yeah non pathologizing approach to have that like well you're not an anxious person there's some felt part of you that feels that way and this other part that feels angry towards that and Absolutely. And IFS is great and has helped many people. We do differ from them somewhat. And and perhaps in an even more radical acceptance and non-interference with what's going on. But um, would like to say there's no enemy inside you. Nothing in you is trying to hurt you. There are no saboteurs. Everything that's going on, even if it's obviously self-destructive, is from a part that's trying to help somehow. And that's, you know, 35, 40 years of working with people, no exceptions, including myself. Yeah, That's good to hear. Yeah, it's really um, um, leans on the coherence of people's inner world. It's not like, oh, you have this problem, there's something chemical imbalance, like 
you know, it's no. it's like there's some inner part that it probably some way is trying to protect you, like you said, even if it's sabotaging things you enjoy that's or relationships. Right. That's yeah. right. In Wonderful. its world, that's what it has to do to keep you safe. Mm-hmm. And by being in relationship with it and listening to it, giving it empathy, that un- unravels. <laughs> yeah. Especially, yeah, I mean, especially if it's a, I imagine, a, a traumatized part or a part that was literally alone in the face of some adversity and you're offering it this like connection understanding empathy that maybe that part has never experienced it's probably just like you could see how it would unfold after that well actually i think one of the definitions of trauma is that there's a missing experience at the time because hard things can happen to people and they can be okay but there needed to be a repair there needed to be usually somebody in the environment who sat down with you and said, wow, that was hard and you feel bad. And and that's been missing. And that's why I think that's where parts come from. If you go, if you start with a block in the present, you're going to go back to a time in the past when there was what Jenlin calls a stoppage, meaning that what life needed next, usually it's relational wasn't there so what barbara and i are doing is supplying the missing relationship and it's an inner relationship so i facilitate a client maybe you could say to that younger you that you sense how hard that is what he is was going through because the part is in the past so i invented a double verb is was (laughs) <laughs> let him know you really get how hard that was and still is and see if he can feel you there and it yeah it it's, changes it's, things yeah it's like that's that's like that sort of juxtaposition is what the brain needs to create transformational change. Like suddenly this part that was so alone in the face of this terrible thing is now having you as the adult self tending to it which is like your mind the mind's probably going oh wow this is um and 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 in the presence of a therapist or clinician or facilitator who's also giving that kind of acceptance it's even more likely to happen even more powerful i call that nested relationships so we have an inner relationship in the client that's accepting compassionate and present and that's nested in a relationship between the client and the clinician that's also compassionate, empathic, and present. Mm-hmm. Would you ever be transparent about that very thing? Like if a client is tending to this part, perhaps, and would you ever say like, and I'm, I'm here with you too? I'm- yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Or do you remember earlier we were talking about the language of let's? So rather than you might be with that, I might say, let's be with that. And that is a subtle way of including yourself where you're not, I mean, I'm not saying I would, I never, I mean, sometimes I do say, and and I'm here with you with that, but it's more often, it's more frequent that I would say, yeah, let's be with that. Let's give that some company now and just include with an assumption we're both here. Sure. Do you find yourself incorporating thinking and techniques from other experiential methodologies? Yeah. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Well, over the years, I have learned things from other methodologies, and I use them freely. You know, I'll, I'll use anything I can get. One of the things that I found really helpful was learning that in SE, somatic experiencing, there is an invitation to look around the room. And that's part of the titration where the present moment and the past experience can both be here and the client can kind of have both at the same time. Well, I I invite people to look around the room. (laughs) By the way, SE incorporated focusing, that is Peter Levine knew Gendlin's work and deliberately incorporated focusing into that. And so did Hakomi therapy and AEDP. That's Diana Foch's work. I saw some videos of her working with clients and how often she liked to just make a present moment 
statement to the client of, of how meaningful the, the session had been or how she felt there with them. I could really feel the power of that. And I do that with people now often when our session is ending. I may take a moment to say, I'm just really feeling touched right now by the depth of your work today. I'm so privileged that I could be with you for it. And it, I say it because it's true. But I, but I feel um, I come from the Midwest and we sort of had a don't say things that are emotional to people. And so I, I've had to recover from that. And uh, I'm happy to have Diana's support in being, it's okay to say those things to people. It mm -hmm. helps. Yeah. 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 I think that's a really important part of this work, especially as someone is in, uh, in doing this type of work that, you know, to feel that the therapist is able to reveal their experience about the process too, like the self-disclosure is, is probably really an important part of the process. So that, you know, it's, this kind of gone are the days of the sort of you know, lay down on the couch, don't look at me kind of Freud stuff. You know, it's like, I'm in this with you. I'm having an experience too. I'm also going to share it, which is really probably helpful for the client. You know, you remind me, you remind me of one of my favorite quotes from Eugene Gendlin. He was speaking to an audience of psychotherapists, some of whom felt suspicious of his work. And he started by saying, he said, I'm going to start with the most important thing I have to say. And that is, for therapy, what we need most of all is for a person to be with a person. And he said, I have my own feelings and I keep them here close. I have all the things I've learned and I keep them over here close. But between me and the client, there's just, we're, I'm a person and they're a person. And if they look at me, I have to take the risk that they'll see that I'm slightly shaky and insecure. I have to be willing to stand that because that's the most important thing of all, a person with a person. I love that. And it, it's reminding me of like Carl Rogers and stuff of like his his way of doing stuff. And That's right. And He's an amazing, an amazing experiential therapist, Rogers, mm -hmm. who is always open to learning. And I think... We can learn new things, and many of them can be used as techniques. And there's a different way of holding the things we learn over on the side, but never more important than this person and me being there with them as a person. If we start drifting over into what should I say now, according to this technique, and we've lost our contact with this person in this moment, and me here with you, then it's not going to work as well. And it's not going to feel as good either. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can see how the, the if you're too in your head about like the process, where you are, where you should be, and the client's trying to do this sort of more deeper inner stuff, it's like there's a disconnect in where yeah. you and the client are. So really, I know you mentioned before about doing your focusing in the session and really being like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm 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 responding to my client from here. And yeah. because that's where they are is, is really yeah necessary um and that was kind of the next question if it sort of if, if people want to get into this type of doing stuff maybe they want to learn it for themselves or, or to use with with clients like what do you what do you recommend like how, where would you point people to well of course i most recommend that people take my course <laughs> i have a course an 18 week course it's called Your Path to Lasting Change, and it's my fundamental foundation focusing course from beginning to advanced in 18 weeks, and it has a healing professional track, an additional track, so that not everyone in the course has to be a healing professional, but those who are can spend extra time meeting and, and watching a few extra videos and doing some readings about how to apply this with clients immediately. And my website is focusingresources.com. And we start this course, Your Path to Lasting Change, three times a year at different times in the day to accommodate different time zones. And it's, I would say, the best way to learn focusing for yourself. We teach people focusing partnership 
which means you and another person exchange the skills. And focusing partnerships are a wonderful community wellness model where friends can be present for the for the inner work of each other. Or if you weren't a friend before you met your focusing partner, you'll become friends. And I have a focusing partner. I actually have three. <laughs> so so there are other ways to learn focusing. I have a I have a book called The Power of Focusing. I have an audio training called Learning Focusing. There's a on-demand course if people don't want to do a live course. It's called Shift. And I'm going to tell people about my my book now. This is uh, Focusing in Clinical Practice, The Essence of Change. Amazon, Kindle, it, it, it's available, probably used too. <laughs> and I think this is a great book. It really takes you through what is focusing, where did it come from, how do you facilitate it in clients. There's a chapter on 10 commonly used types of therapy and how focusing can be combined with each one. So the very first thing I said to you today, Sam, was focusing isn't really a therapy. I wrote this book so that people could incorporate focusing into whatever modality they do. As long as your modality has some degree of empathy, then you can incorporate focusing. And as I studied the different modalities for this book, there is no kind of modality that isn't interested in empathy. They're all interested in empathy. So focusing can go with everything. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love the 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 umbrella sort of uh way way that it works that way. And that it's not like, well, you need to stop everything you've been doing and do it this way. It's like oh. a, well, you can probably just incorporate this into your work as a way of deepening it. And um, you don't even have to use focusing in talking to your client. Oh, now we're going to do focusing. Just talk a little differently. Let's pause now. Let's just be with that. I love mm -hmm. it. And it sounds like the 18 week course has a lot of the uh, experiential learning, like having the, the focusing partner, you're really doing it and feeling what it's like to be on the receiving end and, and, and the facilitator too. Primarily experiential. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, this has been so great, Anne. I'm sure there's we could talk for hours based on your experience and, and, and knowledge. And I really appreciate you taking the time. This has been really eye-opening for me. And um, I'm sure people are going to really um, love to hear what you have to say. Is there any, any, any final nuggets of focusing wisdom before we wrap up? Well, I, I do feel the need to mention my new book, which is not out yet, but should be within six months. It's called Untangling. How to Transform What's Impossibly Stuck. And it's by me and Barbara McGavin about this particular method of working with really stuck places in your life using the inner relationship I've talked about today. So watch for untangling. And what are my final gems of wisdom? Enjoy. Enjoy clients. Enjoy the endless fascination of human beings. How they grow and change it's really so so much fun yeah yeah and it'd be even more fun when we get your new book and we figure out how to <laughs> work with those particularly challenging uh parts so i'm looking yes. forward to that oh great thank you all uh, right well it's been a thanks pleasure thanks a lot and yeah thank you we'll we'll post all the links and stuff in the um below the, yeah. the video so everyone can see where to get books and, and trainings and stuff Super. but yeah thank you so much